Hello and welcome to this month's slightly late Nerdline news. It has been a quiet one this month, but we have stories about a supernova, 5G troubles, climate change, industrial action and some space news. But we start off with flat earthers in Brazil. We have been saying for a while that flat earth is dying and this is all based on how much activity we subjectively see around the topic and reports of how many times the phrase flat earth is searched for on Google. But what if we queried it in another language, namely Portuguese? Now we see a radically different result from the word terra plana. We see the same bump in 2017 and the trend tailing off. However, it has been increasing steadily again since the start of 2019. A recent survey by the Brazilian polling firm Datafolha asked for a nationally representative sample containing 2,086 respondents, and it asked about their beliefs regarding the shape of the Earth. Extrapolation to the wider population, the result actually shows that approximately 11 million Brazilians believe that the Earth is flat. This is 7% of the population. Demographic data shows rather unsurprisingly that the belief is most common among younger and less educated groups. Academic staff in the UK have put their equipment down and have gone on strike for eight days. So what are the strikes about? The dispute with the universities is fourfold. The first is around equality. Unsurprisingly, it has been consistently shown that women and ethnic minorities are being treated less well than their white male equivalents, and they're being paid less. Now, this is a problem throughout society, but particularly obvious in academia. And this is particularly concerning, considering that universities are supposed to be a paragon of equality and meritocracy. Another issue is fair pay. In real terms, academic wages have dropped by 20% over the past 10 years, whilst living costs in the UK, and specifically university cities, have increased dramatically. Now this is pretty bad, especially if you consider it in light of the next few points. Whilst being paid less, workloads are steadily increasing, even though academics are generally quite happy to work extremely long days and balance several projects at the same time, this appears to no longer be enough for the universities. With increasing teaching workloads without sufficient investment in additional staff and resources, along with an ever-increasing pressure to publish, expectations to participate in numerous committees, unpaid participation in a peer review process, and a never-ending cycle of grant applications, and somewhere along the line, we actually need to still do the research that is core to our jobs. Finally, we have the point of job security. Now, most academics are on fixed term contracts and even zero hours contracts where there's no guarantee for work and the contracts can be terminated with little or no notice. In general, the goodwill and passion that academics have for their work is being exploited by the universities and needless to say, staff are getting a bit pissed off. For all the conspiracies around 5G, there are a few things that we should be concerned about. 5G will be operating in a 24 gigahertz frequency band to facilitate high data transfer rates. The problem comes due to water vapor emitting a signal at 23.8 gigahertz. Now, this is a property that weather satellites exploit to track weather vapor in the atmosphere, and it is essential in tracking things like hurricanes. The issues lie around something called out-of-band emission, where a device transmits within its band, but this does result in noise outside of the frequency band. If the noise is sufficiently high, a 5G station will then show up on the satellites as a big cloud formation and mess up all the measurements. Now, at the recent World Communications Conference in Egypt, the World Meteorological Organization set out to allow the out-of-band noise of up to minus 42 decibel watts, but the International Telecommunications Union ended up deciding that minus 33 decibel watts was sufficient. Unhappy scientists of the WMO did end up getting a concession that the limit would be changed to minus 39 decibel watts in eight years' time. And as far as I can see, that is a lot of predictions that can get fucked up in the next eight years. For those who are also not familiar with the unit of decibel, 10 dB represents an order of magnitude difference. And we're also not talking about simple, oh, will it rain tomorrow type predictions. No, we are also talking about, hmm, which region should we evacuate because there's a big fucking hurricane coming type predictions. 
But naturally, despite objections from the experts, the regulation is awarded in favour of business. Now, this story is interesting to me because it clearly shows that this whole conspiracy stuff about scientists and government and big business all being in cahoots is clearly nonsense. But to add a little bit of extra flavour to the mix, research from NASA and the US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association has shown that even the minus 42 decibel watt limit proposed by the WMO is too lenient and their findings show that the limit should actually be set at around minus 52 decibel watts. And the US government has completely ignored that and set their limit at minus 20 decibel watts three orders of magnitude higher than recommended. In 1987, we observed a supernova in a large Magellanic cloud. In a freak event, astronomers actually gave something a sensible name by calling it 1987A, but the object has been causing a bit of confusion. Supernovae of this size should leave some remnant, usually a neutron star, but we haven't really been able to see this one. And this is a bit annoying as this event should present a nice test case to test our theories. Now, in a recent paper, researchers outlined their study of a dust cloud, or they call it the blob, that surrounds the area where the remnant is expected to be. They conclude that the neutron star is indeed most likely there. The hot neutron star emits radiation that is absorbed by the dust cloud, which is then re-radiated by the blob at a different wavelength. The power output of the cloud is shown to be consistent with one would expect if there were a neutron star in the middle. The cool thing about this is that we can measure stuff and make predictions based on our theory. In the next 50 to 100 years, the dust cloud should clear and we will be able to see if our predictions were correct. 20 or so years ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change introduced the idea of tipping points, which are abrupt and irreversible changes in the climate system which may accelerate climate change itself. Back then, it was believed that these tipping points were only likely if global temperatures exceeded 5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. The latest reports of the IPCC update this estimate to somewhere between 1 and 2 degrees. These tipping points have been identified as follows. Frequent droughts in the rainforests, reduction in the area of Arctic sea ice, slowdown of the Atlantic circulation, fires and changes in pests in boreal forests, large scale die offs in coral reefs, accelerating ice loss of the Greenland ice shelf, thawing permafrost, accelerating ice loss of the West Antarctic ice shelf, and the same for the Wilkes Basin ice shelf. One of the most concerning things is that reaching one of these tipping points may trigger another in a positive feedback loop. In a recent comment article in Nature, the authors argue that if we haven't already actually triggered one of these tipping points, then we are dangerously close. So close, in fact, that we have run out of time to respond. And the best that we can hope for is to reduce the rate at which these processes happen. If I'm honest, at first I thought that this article may be a bit alarmist, but having thought about it for a while, it doesn't actually seem too far-fetched. Check the link in the description and read it for yourself. And that was it from us for this month. You can find the links to the sources in the description and you will catch us next month where we will probably have a look at the Christmas editions of our favourite science journals. Until then, let's drop that bass.